Nice. Okay. I'm seeing Vienna, Virginia, Richmond, a lot of Alexandria, Arlington, uh, Charlottesville, uh, Reka, Athens, Greece, uh, Virginia, Washington, DC, where Arlington. Nice. Looks like we have a good, good group here today. Ooh, Iowa City. Northern Virginia, lovely. Okay, guys, I think it is time for us to get started. So I would like to say, welcome everyone. And thank you for joining us uh, today for today's webinar. It's actually Sustainability Day. So what a great way to celebrate. My name is Michelle Kowach and I will be your moderator for today's event. I am a volunteer in the Alexandria, Virginia chapter of Citizens Climate Lobby. Today, we will be learning about a zero waste lifestyle and the different aspects that it, it, can, can, it can include. We'll be joined by some very special guests uh, from Mason and Greens and Citizens Climate Lobby. But before we begin, I would like to go over a few guidelines. If you have any questions at all during the presentation, please type them into the chat. We've designated the last 10 minutes of the webinar to answering your questions and we will be monitoring the chat to make sure we don't miss anything. If we can't answer all of the questions during the webinar today, we will send out an email addressing them all afterwards within the next two days. Also, I would like to note that we will be recording this webinar to share with those that are interested but who could not attend. And this information and recording will also be shared in that same email. Now, without further ado, I would like to introduce Anna and, Anna and Justin Marino. They are the wonderful owners of Mason and Greens, the DC area's first zero waste and sustainable dry goods and grocery. All right, Anna and Justin. Hi, <laughs> Hello. Yeah, so um, I think we should first start talking about what zero waste is. Um, for us, Zero waste is finding a way to make better use of what you have and making better choices in what you consume so that you can ultimately reduce and eliminate what you discard. Um, these are the important things that, that sometimes we lose and we don't think about because it's out of sight, out of mind. For example, when we put something in the garbage, we take it out to our property line, throw it down the trash chute, whatever you may do with it, and we don't think about it again. We don't think about the person who comes to pick it up. We don't think about the transport to the dump. We don't think about it sitting in the hills into our water. Um, we don't, it's, it's pretty much out of sight, out of mind once it leaves our, um, our, our purview. So the, the problem with that is you think about the, the first toothbrush that you ever had. It's still on this planet. It still exists somewhere. Um, you know, I think about that Band-Aid that my mom put on my knee when I skinned it back in 1981. Yeah, that's still on the planet. Um, these things just don't go anywhere. Um, and they, and this is the real problem with waste and with, um, with our, our sort of consumption and how we look at it. And so what I think what we want to talk about is what is you know how how do we um sort of reduce what we what we consume how do we make ourselves healthier how do we make the planet healthier uh so i think we'll start the uh, there's a lot that goes into living zero waste um and reducing your daily footprint but i always like to kind of start with some facts uh that most people mo typically don't know or haven't heard before, or if they have, they don't understand the full scope of it. Uh, every day we're told to recycle uh, everyday products that we put into, uh, we bring into our homes. Uh, you think your shampoo bottles, your um, like food containers, but really of all the recycling that we do, only eight to 9% of it globally actually gets reused and recycled. Um, most of the rest of it will just end up in a landfill, which I think is a pretty shocking number that we're not doing anything with it. It's just either it's too degraded of a material or it's too dirty uh, just to be reused. So we need to. Or other materials that, uh, 
that it would replace are cheaper. Um, and, and therein lies a, a, a very large problem is, um, you know, especially with plastics, virgin plastics tend to be cheaper than recycled plastics do. So there's not a lot of motivation for, um, for big companies to, to actually use recycled material. Um, right, yes. <laughs> uh, and so, yeah, we talked about um, reducing waste will eliminate so um, where did you want to go? Yeah, yeah. One of the um, uh, one of the interesting things is um, when we talk about the the products that we're buying, you know, for example, at the grocery, um, we just about everything comes in packaging. There are very few things that you can go to the grocery store, and and the the pandemic for has actually had an impact on that as well. You you started to see uh, people individually wrapping pieces of fruit and and this type of stuff and and it's just 100 not necessary and contributes to the problem and that we're you know that that we're all facing here um it, it's one of those things where if you just actually took a step back just took a step outside of yourself and looked in the grocery store at everything in there the amount of packaging is staggering and this is not going anywhere. This is packaging, you know, some of the cardboard packaging can be recycled. This is excellent. Um, does it get recycled? Hard to say. Um, that's that's something that's probably more suited for someone who works with a recycling program. Um, but uh, the the amount of plastics that just don't go anywhere and and live on this planet forever are uh, really the, the 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 deeply the deepest rooted problem that we have right now. Yeah, so when we don't do anything with recycling, unfortunately, it ends up in our waterways, which segue into our oceans. And um, people have been talking a lot about the Gar the great Gar Pacific Ocean garbage, patch, <laughs> garbage yeah. patch out in the Pacific Ocean. Um, and it's just swirling islands of garbage out there. There's a island out there called Henderson Island. Um, in the Atlantic? Yeah. No, yeah, the Pacific. Okay. Yes. <laughs> uh, and they have found microplastics and trash washed up on the beaches there. And there's nobody lives on this island. So nowhere on the planet is untouched by the waste that we are creating. And, and yeah, there was a um, there was a uh, woman who was doing a study on uh, spores. Uh, she wanted to see how spores traveled in the upper atmosphere around the planet. So she tried to find the, one of the most remote places in the United States to do this study, uh, where she set up a bunch of sensors to collect um, spores from plants. And so she set them up in, out in the Joshua Tree uh, National Park, in, in one of the most remote places in the country, and um, she was surprised to find a significant amount of microplastics that got collected by her sensors. This stuff is in the air. It is, there's no escaping it. It's in our bodies, it's in the air. And, and the, the only, one of the only ways to combat this is to stop consuming this. Um, of what we're uh, what we're consuming. Yep. So that's going to segue into why, on a personal level, should we adopt a zero waste lifestyle? Uh, a lot of it. We're going to talk a lot about plastic because that's a big part of zero waste and just living a healthier life for you and for the planet. Um, there's a lot of toxic chemicals that come with the production of plastic, with the consumption of plastic. So when you're switching over and eliminating these materials in your life, you're inadvertently going to eliminate a lot of the toxins that come into your body. We hear a lot about BPA-free, but what I don't think a lot of people understand is that while they've eliminated BPAs from a lot of stuff, they've just replaced it with other harmful chemicals like BPF and BPS. So it's, if not more harmful or just as equally harmful as having BPAs, which is just why we should eliminate any food consumption product made from plastic because you're still going to get it. And these are really dangerous. They're hormone disruptors. Um, they can... 
Yeah, they, they do damage to the body that, uh, again, scientists are, are just some sometimes now figuring out. Um, there, there have been studies on these things, though, for, for decades, and, and people know they are bad. Um, so, so innovation comes, a new, a new chemical to line a can with comes, you know, comes to market, and uh, then, again, it's studied, and they find out that again, it is toxic. So the best way to do th do these things is maybe get rid of the cans, you know, or maybe come up with a different sort of packaging solution, something that uh, that that's actually stable and does not um, uh, poison people and the planet at the same time. So. Um, one of the other things we want to talk about is the, uh, the in production of packaging. Um, there, there are there. Anna touched on it earlier. There are a lot of uh, chemicals that go into the the and and that are involved in the process itself. That um, that are uh, that industry has to discard themselves. So so not only are they giving us something that is, you know, potentially dangerous for us um, to consume, but they're also pumping chemicals into the water. They're they're doing all sorts of other damage to the planet that we can't um, that 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 we may not necessarily see. Again, it's out of sight, out of mind. We don't see what's coming out of these uh, these factories we don't under, we don't necessarily know what is uh, even even people who are who have studied it don't know what is coming out of some of these factories and this is sort of one of those challenges that needs to be addressed as well because it affects us all um, it affects the 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 people who live on the planet and the planet itself are you scared now <laughs> <laughs> So now that we've touched just a little bit, uh, we could go on for hours about the negative effects of plastics and, and trash in our bodies, our waterways, our planet, the ecosystem. Uh, but now we'll we'll kind of move a little bit further on into why, how, what we can do. Uh, it can get a little bit more lively here, less <laughs> gloom and doom. So whenever we talk about moving to a more sustainable lifestyle people always just assume that it's going to be expensive it's going to take a lot of time money right. effort um all of these things and it doesn't have to be um when you're actually only buying what you need usually it's going to be cheaper um for example uh, we sell kale by the leaf instead of by the bunch you know, you, you, your smoothie only is going to take like two leaves of kale. Okay, well, that's great. You can't get that anywhere, um, you know, or at most places. Um, the, the You have to buy a whole bunch, and sometimes that bunch goes to waste. So, so again, it's just reducing the amount of waste that we do has a positive impact. You know, flour, if, uh, you know, if a recipe calls for a cup of flour, and you end up getting a pound, pound of flour that you're never going to use, that's going to eventually be trash. So, and that's not helping anyone um, at that point. Um, some of the uh, some of the other products, you know, we think about the the containers that uh, that people will sell us products in, like laundry detergent. Um, and and those containers are kind of uh, they're 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 reusable. You can actually use them. You can fill them up again. Um, because they're they're sort of made to be a little bit durable. And so so these are the things that maybe people don't uh, don't know and and you know don't know that you can actually do this. That there are places where you can refill uh, these containers, so you don't have to buy a new one every time you purchase a product. Right, and the time saving factor of it as well. Just think of a Ziploc bag. You buy a box of thirty Ziploc bags. Every time you use one, you throw it away. Some people will reuse them. Um, and then when you run out of that bag, you have to go back to the store, buy, buy another bag, and while you're there, you're shopping around, you're wasting time. So if you just have a container that you can refill and you have at home and you just clean it over and over again, one, you're not spending money on buying more bags that are just going to end up in the trash. And then you're also saving time because you're not having to drive around to find the bags that you want. Uh, and that just goes for a whole slew of other products that we typically use or have become accustomed to using. Think of paper towels. It's not really necessary if you just use a reusable napkin. Yeah, so now we want to talk about swaps. Um, you know, different, uh, 
different things that you can change in your life that are easy. Um, these are easy changes that, um, that you can make in your household to, to actually have an impact. Um, yeah, I think one of the easiest ones is the use of reusable napkins as opposed to paper towels. Uh, paper towels aren't plastic, but they do end up um, they're filling for, up a lot of your trash. They do. Um, yes. You know, mm -hmm. you you wipe your hands, you discard it. You wipe your hands. Hey, uh, just a minute, Anna. You may do that. You know, hundred. Oh, just a minute. I just want to say your video is getting a little bit laggy for a few people. So I just want to, could you guys try with maybe the video off unless you need to like show something? Yeah. Yeah. No problem. All right. All right. Thank you. Let's try that a little bit better. Um, so, um, yeah, um, with the, the paper towels, they tend to accumulate in our trash and fill up our trash bags. And then of course those get sent off to the dumps. So, so instead of using those, um, using something, um, like, uh, uh, Swedish dishcloth, which is absorbent, super absorbent, and, uh, can absorb just about any spill that you may have. Um, and then you can either just rinse it off if you need to, or, um, let it dry out and use it again next time. Um, also reusable napkins. This is another very good one. It's, it's easy to buy a cloth napkin. People will think you're fancy, but you're not actually buying some paper napkins that you're going to be constantly throwing in the trash, um, as well as the, the wrap that they come in. So, um, yeah, there's a lot of different eco swaps you can make with like even eliminating plastic wrap that you, people use every day. You, um, there's vegetable base wraps or vegan or beeswax wraps that you can use and reuse over and over again. Yeah, you can wrap uh, like a tomato in one of these things, a half a tomato. If you didn't, you if you didn't eat a whole tomato, wrap it in that. Um, wrap an apple in it, and they tend to stay pretty uh, pretty good for a, a, a few days. Um, these are you know covering your your Tupperware or what have you with um, with one of these wraps instead of plastic wrap tends to be a, a very effective way to to do things. As well. Yeah. Um, also, you can eliminate a lot of the plastic. Uh, the bathroom tends to be a place where a lot of it accumulates. You think your shampoo, conditioner bars, your body wash, uh, and a lot of that stuff you can actually get in solid bar form, which is going to eliminate a lot of the trash that you end up putting into the your wastebasket. Yeah. Think about dish soap in bar form. It's um, easy enough because usually you put your dish soap on a sponge anyways. Um, so all you have to do is rub the sponge on the, the bar of soap. Works just as well. Um, sometimes even better. Yeah. Would you say that you have a favorite swap that you've gotten really used to uh, using now? Since Yeah, I, I do actually kind of like the soap bars because they're, you know, for, for dish soap, because I, I feel like it, you know, I can control the amount pretty well. I don't, you know, use excess and, and it actually works. It cuts grease. It does whatever I need it to do. So that's, that's definitely one of my favorites. Yeah. And um, on our website, we have a whole, a whole slew of alternatives that you can swap out from your everyday uses. Some things you wouldn't even necessarily think about, um, but there are some definitely necessary swaps that, um, so we had some easy swaps, but there's some that we tend to think are pretty necessary when you really want to make a dent in the waste that you're creating in your day-to-day -day life. Um, and that would be composting, um, which is really huge. When you start composting, you just realize how much food you're actually just throwing away in a landfill. And it doesn't actually break down food. Nothing actually breaks down in a landfill. So composting will actually take those um, bits of, of food and waste that you don't normally use and turn them into um, yeah it's a very circular um circular system right it, it turns it into nutrients that can grow more plants um and this is always good um so i think one of the um one of the last things we wanted to talk about is is the packaging itself and and the way that um that we do things now um the the plastic is 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 an interesting thing. It's it's almost a paradox, isn't it? Um, this is a material that's both durable and disposable. Therein lies the problem. If more people thought maybe 
um, can I get my laundry detergent bottle refilled, like I mentioned earlier? Or, hey, why do I need to throw out this soap dispenser with a pump top? We could certainly have a positive impact on the planet. Um, and I think that should be probably about it for time for us. Yeah. All right. Justin and Anna, thank you so much for your thorough introduction into zero waste for everyone. You guys covered a lot of material, but I think it's a great headway into the speakers from Citizens Climate Lobby and what they're going to discuss. So we have zero waste from another aspect when you think about not only some of the things like the um, waste, and the more solid waste and landfills in the oceans, but also um, carbon emissions and your carbon footprint as well, and how you can impact that. And so I would now like to introduce John Clark, who is a Citizen Climate Lobby, C Citizen Climate Lobby Appalachia Regional Coordinator. <laughs> and he actually started out as a volunteer way back in 2011 when he started the first CCL chapter in Pennsylvania. I would also like to introduce Colin Stewart, who is an amazing CCL volunteer of three years. And guys, to get us started, I will ask first off for the people who don't know, what is Citizens Climate Lobby? Sure, yeah. Uh, thanks, Michelle. I'll take that one. Um, CCL is a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization. Uh, it's very much volunteer driven. So much of what we do is uh, dependent on our volunteers in the, in the field. And um, uh, we are we exist pretty much in every con congressional district in the country. We're working with uh, members of Congress to uh, pass comprehensive climate change legislation and uh, create the political will for, for Congress to, to act. Great, can you tell us a little bit about what CCL is currently focusing on? Yes, for sure. Uh, we are laser focused on um, carbon fee and dividend, uh, which would put a price on carbon-based fuels uh, on, on their emissions. So it would be per ton of emissions uh, for every fuel source. But coal would be taxed the heavy, heaviest, uh, and then oil, and then natural gas. Um, and that would be at, placed at the source. So at the mine, the wellhead, or the port of entry where fossil fuels are imported. And um, this would uh, act as kind of a catalyst to change people's behavior and uh, reduce the amount of fossil fuels, reduce their, their carbon footprint. Um, and we don't wanna break, break our economy and we don't wanna harm uh, lower income families um, because this is gonna uh, rise the, the cost of fossil fuels. So we wanna take that revenue and give as much back to households uh, as we can. So can you tell us why CCL decided to focus on carbon and a carbon fee and carbon dividend? Yeah, I could take that one. Um, so there are a couple of benefits to the uh, carbon fee and dividend approach. And one of them is that it doesn't really pick winners or losers. It just sort of addresses carbon where it enters the economy. I mean, that means that we don't have to play a sort of game of whack-a-mole of regulating one type of product or um, service. And if we regulate that, then it becomes more efficient to use something else, but those alternatives might not necessarily be more carbon efficient. So by just putting a blanket fee on all carbon entering the economy, um, it's a more free market approach. Um, another benefit is that it doesn't uh, require us to sort of guess future technologies. So we can anticipate that cars will get more efficient every year, but um, folks in the past might not have anticipated um, fully electric cars. And we might not know what the fully electric cars of the future are and a groundbreaking technology. I mean, we don't have to if we're only charging for the carbon entering our economy. And then lastly, um, it does have some benefits over alternative approaches like a cap and trade where um, we're just putting a blanket price on carbon. So any carbon that goes into the economy um, and a sort of cap and trade uh, strategy, um, we might not be incentivized to go below whatever the max for that year is. So with this, um, we can go above and beyond what the maximum limits are. Mm -hmm. What are some of the ways that CCL is working towards this goal? Yeah, so um, 
I, I mentioned uh, we exist to create the political will and, and so volunteers all over the country are doing well first off they're lobbying our members of Congress so we're citizens climate lobby uh, so that's the most most important thing that that we're doing we're working with members of Congress in fact we have a, a lobby day event um, a virtual lobby day event coming up here in the next couple of weeks where we're going to try to meet with every member of Congress um and give them updates on on fee and dividend and, and um so uh, part of uh, creating that political will is we're we're well first off we we we're operating with the understanding that um members of congress don't create political will they respond to it uh for the most part and so we're creating as much political will as we can and, and some of the things that we do are uh you know events like this um educational events on on climate change on zero waste on on fee and dividend um we do movie nights um where we show educational movies to the general public uh, we do tabling events where we'll we'll set up like at a farmer's market or some kind of uh, green event or or any kind of event and and get what we call constituent comment form signed um, so constituents can uh, you know write their their member of congress uh, about their concern for climate change and we'll take those forms to the member of congress in our lobby meetings and and you know show that concern by by their constituents um there's so many uh, i mean we're, we're kind of adapted to a virtual world now because of covid so we do a lot of uh, you know zoom events virtual events now like such as this one um so yeah that a lot of educating the public and outreach and and just getting uh people to contact their representatives and their senators to to um, support carbon pricing right now mm -hmm. Thank you guys. So now that you've given everyone an idea of what CCL is and what they do and uh, how they work, could you guys talk a little bit more about how making your voice heard on environmental topics relates to a zero waste lifestyle? Yeah, um, so when we think about a zero waste lifestyle, um, I think Justin and Anna did a great job when they talked about the sort of out of sight, out of mind approach a lot of folks have. Um, but, you know, it's not just the obvious stuff that contributes to the waste in, you know, our day-to-day -day lives. Um, it's also things like the micro trash, um, and a big part of that is carbon. Um, so when we use a given product or, or service, if carbon is emitted, we, the consumer, don't necessarily see that. That might go into the manufacturer. And it, uh, unlike, you know, waste, where you can kind of put that in a dump, which is not great, but it's sort of sequestered underground, you know, carbon is floating in the air. It's affecting all of us all over the world. So um, a zero carbon um, emission lifestyle is a very critical part of the zero waste lifestyle. And, you know, as we can see so far, um, there's a lot of um, changes that we need to make. So making your voice heard on these issues is critically important to a, an overall zero waste lifestyle. Mm -hmm. So if people do want to, you know, help make their voice heard, can you tell us about some of the CCL tools that people can use to help make a difference? Yeah, absolutely. And in fact, I'll share my screen and show you some, some uh, easy tools that you can use. Um, so, bear with me one second. So, um, at our site, citizensclimatelobby.org, we have, um, a, this is the homepage and you can go up here to take action, um, right down here. Uh, you can sign up for text alerts when we have a special, something special going on right now. Uh, we have carbon pricing, uh, we're, we're promoting through, uh, through the reconciliation budget process. Um, we have a right Congress tool, so um, you can click on this, uh, which I'll just show you. You enter your street address, your zip code. Um, it will look up your member of Congress for you. Um, and there's a script already there for you. Um, 
and it's 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 very simple it takes just you know a few minutes to to contact your member of congress and and it's important um for members of congress to hear from their constituents um they're they're working for us uh so um i always say the best way to not get something is to not ask for it so we need to be asking for for what we want on on uh, climate change and specifically carbon pricing um another tool we have is called congress which is the same thing um that'll look up your members of congress um, and it'll give you the the phone numbers for your member of congress and a script um this one is one of my favorites the monthly calling campaign so if you sign up for the monthly calling campaign you just type your name first name and last name how should we contact you text message or email and once a month you'll get a, either a text message or email whichever you prefer a reminder to call your member of congress and it's a random day so we don't want everyone uh, calling on the same day, we, we want to spread out the, the number of calls. So they're hearing pretty regularly from us, uh, you know, you know, five times, six times a day, 10 times, uh, uh, you know, that we want uh, action on climate change and, and carbon pricing. Um, and then you just hit register and you'll get that once a month reminder. And, and it's important to, to follow through and make those calls. Uh, because you know they'll stand up and take notice when they start hearing from their constituents on a on a daily basis. Uh, there's a tweet Congress tool. Uh, if you're on Twitter, I know a lot of us are. Um, same thing. It'll look up your your member of Congress through your your street address and zip code. Um, we have a. Um, a community what's called community it's kind of a networking uh site for uh ccl members um so i highly recommend uh, joining ccl and, and getting access to this community dashboard and and uh we have a little bit a few more uh action tools on community that you can that you can use right now we have um i'll just type it in here um www.cclusa.org slash white house and whoops did I shoot one second here is there sorry so we have a special um action right now we're trying to get twenty thousand emails to president biden um asking him to put a price on carbon uh through this year's budget reconciliation it's important that biden um supports this uh, he can help get uh you know you've probably heard senator manchin is a kind of a holdout on on climate action being the senator from west virginia and a couple other senators so um, getting President Biden on board, he can also help with getting those senators uh, to support carbon pricing. So yeah, these are just a, a few of our tools. They're easy to use, um, quick, quick and effective. So you know, please do take action. John, for those who have not used the tools before, how quick uh, would you say that they are? Oh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I get, I'm part of the monthly calling campaign and that's probably the most uh, labor intensive tool that we have. And it literally takes me five, less than five minutes a month to make three phone calls. You'll get, um, I get a text every month saying, you know, call your, your representative. Um, and then, you know, you, there's a script right there for you. And once you call your representative, you just click done. And then it gives you the option to call your senators as well. Um, and I do all three every month, the, my representative and both my senators. And it, it literally takes me less than five minutes to make three phone calls. And almost always I get the voicemail. So I'm not talking to an actual person. Um, you know, if you're a little hesitant about talking to your your member of Congress, or uh, it's always it's always a, a staff member that answers if someone does pick up. 
um, and they're not going to give you any kind of pushback. Um, they're there just to take your your calls um, and record what what your your concerns are. So they'll have like a little uh, kind of a tally, like oh, this person called about carbon pricing. So you know they'll check off that that tally and and let their representative know. So uh, if you don't want to talk to a person. Um, you can always call after hours and, and get a voicemail, but often I get a voicemail during hours uh, because they're busy, uh, busy people, and busy offices. So. That's great. Thank you, John. Sure. Uh, Colin, so how, can you go over it just again to kind of reiterate if uh, in case some people just joined, um, can you emphasize how does a carbon fee for, you know, all these other businesses and industries, how does that relate to an individual who is trying to go zero waste or live more sustainably. Yeah, so having a, a carbon fee on you know, everyone where carbon is entering the economy is really important because we as consumers don't necessarily see what's going on behind the scenes and how stuff is made, right? So if there's a given industrial process that's more carbon efficient to make a certain good, then I personally might not see that as the consumer. But if a company is paying a carbon fee, then that would be a cost saving process for them. So that helps in one way. The other way is that, uh, you know, there are things like nutrition labels for food and people don't always look at them. But for carbon, there's not even a label. We don't really have products that say, you know, it's producing X tons of carbon. So having um, that uh, price be um, put on carbon entering our economy really helps uh, customers make informed choices. They don't have to go in and research, you know, this product versus this product is more carbon intensive. It'll be reflected in the price and that will make things a little bit more obvious. I know one example is like the meat that we choose to eat. Uh, if you choose to eat meat, um, beef is I think three times more uh, carbon emitting than poultry. And that's maybe something not a lot of consumers know about. So having those fees really helps um, all of us, both businesses and individuals, uh, make smarter decisions about the products we use. Thank you, Colin. Yeah, it's uh, not all businesses are as considerate as Mason and Greens when they <laughs> consider their pro products and trying to source locally and looking at other businesses that try to consider their carbon footprint. Um, Colin and John, so people might be wondering, does that one email, does that phone call, does it make a difference when you reach out? And uh, could you touch on that? Yeah, um, I guess I can go first because I'm a little bit newer of a, of a CCL volunteer. And I was really struck by this when I started um, working with Citizens Climate Lobby of how working together is super critical for addressing these large issues. You know, it wasn't a single one of us that caused all these carbon emissions leading to climate change. And it's not going to be a single one of us that fixes it all in one blow. Um, I think John said something that I really uh, appreciate, which is building the political will for something. You know, eventually when a carbon pricing bill goes into effect, everyone's going to look at the news and say, good job, job well done. And they don't see, again, those hidden measures going on behind that, the phone calls and the letter writing and all of this um, political action that we're taking together. Um, I know when I go and I call my, you know, Congress people, um, I feel just so much better thinking about all the other folks just like me around the United States. You know, Citizens Climate Lobby has chapters in every single state. Um, there's folks just like you taking the time to make those calls. Um, so really just having that organization is so important and uh, it really makes me feel better as a volunteer to know that I'm not the only one in this fight. Thank you, Colin. All right, last question is, I think um, people are going to be wondering, how is the progress going on the bill? Yes, uh, good question. Uh, we actually have, um, I mentioned we're nonpartisan. We, we always try to, to work uh, across the aisle with, with both parties. Um, you know, we have a, a bipartisan, we had a bipartisan bill last year called the Energy Innovation Carbon Dividend Act. Um, it was, uh, we had, I think, 85 Democrats and one Republican on board. Um, this year, unfortunately, we could not get a Republican. And kind of our, politi our political climate right now is hyper partisan. Um, we're, we actually have uh, a chance of getting carbon pricing passed through the budget reconciliation process. Unfortunately, that's a pretty partisan process. Um, and we don't expect Republicans to get on board with, with uh, 
you know, getting this passed through through uh, reconciliation. It doesn't mean we're we're giving up on working with Republicans. We work with every Republican office in the in the country. Um, but as our executive director Mark Reynolds said, uh, you know, we have an obligation to to fix climate change, and and when we have an opportunity, you know, we're we're going to take it. Um, so we're, that's that's kind of the situation where we're in now uh, through the budget reconciliation process. There's a chance that um, carbon pricing will will be passed in the in the Senate and then the House and signed into, into law this year. So stay tuned. We're kind of in limbo right now. There's uh, the whole reconciliation process is ongoing. They're they're making the sausage as we speak. Um, so if you uh, um, follow our, our blog on Citizens Climate Lobby. Um, we we keep everyone up to date on where we're at in the reconciliation process, but it, it looks like we have a, a pretty good shot at, at getting it done this year. Awesome. Thank you both Colin and John for covering a lot of this information in detail. Yeah, you guys did a great job. Um, before we get to the question portion, I would just now like to introduce a three-day sustainability challenge. So uh, taking the tools that we just, uh, like taking the information and tools that we just um, shared with you guys, we want to help encourage you guys to use it. So um, day one of our sustainability challenge is about making a simple sustainable swap. So we're going to quickly go over back to um, Justin and Anna Mason and Greens and have them give just a few examples of some easy, simple swaps you could do for day one. Okay, so yeah, day one, the, um, uh, the, the paper towels is an excellent uh, option. So, so kick those things to the curb. Um, try using a, uh, a rag or a, a Swedish dishcloth or, um, you know, or, or anything else that you can use to, to absorb what you would normally do with a paper towel. Um, cutlery set, water bottles, um, using reusable um, uh, water bottles uh, is, is absolutely an easy one to, to finish. Uh, produce bags at the grocery, um, instead of picking those plastic ones that they have at the grocery, uh, to put your produce in, um, buy a couple of muslin bags or, or mesh black bags. Um, you can buy those, certainly buy those at our shop. I'm sure there are many other places you can buy them um, online and uh, other stores too. Uh, some grocery stores, some larger grocery stores even have them. Um, so, so these are, these are some simple swaps that you can, uh, that you can make. Awesome. Thank you, Justin. So then that brings us to day two. Uh, hey, Michelle, can I throw in one? Oh, yes, of course. Uh, so my wife actually brought home this, um, like, eco strips. They're laundry detergent. Uh, it comes, like, in a little cardboard package um, instead of that big plastic jug, jug of laundry, laundry detergent. They're actually these little strips, and you just tear them off and throw one in the bottom of your, of your washer. It's kind of interesting. So I thought that was pretty cool. Oh, nice. Yeah. Thank you for sharing. Uh, awesome. So yeah, as you guys see, there is, uh, you know, so there are so many different things you can choose from for a simple swap. And then day two, we want to move into uh, making your voice heard. And so uh, we encourage you to use one of CCL's tools that uh, John went through. And again, like you said, they're really quick. They're really easy. They have, they give you all of the information, you know, and are ready to send. You can, they have a pre-filled out template, you can adjust that, personalize it, but we just really encourage you to, yeah, make your voice heard on climate issues because we need both that, uh, not only action in our own lives, but we need to encourage uh, political action to make our world beautiful as well. And then day three, we want you to share what you did, share the simple swap that you made, share that, hey, I just wrote to my local representative, and you can uh, post it on social media with the hashtag simple sustainable uh, steps challenge, which I'll drop in the chat in a moment. Or if you don't have social media, we still encourage you to do this. And just instead of posting it, share what you did with a friend, you know, start a conversation with a family member. 
because all of these steps are small, but you know, if we all make these steps together, they will have a really big impact. And uh, yeah, so a simple, sustainable steps challenge. And we will be emailing out a general resource page after this event, along with the recording. And it just gives you some guidelines uh, about, you know, hey, before you, um, you know, you go shopping, like think about different things to bring or uh, here's some composting resources instead of, uh, you know, throwing stuff away. Um, of course, uh, you know, Mason and Greens or uh, any places where you can try to really reduce the waste and the packaging and the stuff that's unnecessary. Uh, so we'll be sending that out. And now we have actually reached our Q&A portion. We are right on time. So Chris Weigard has been monitoring our chat for us. Uh, and he will take some questions. All right, Chris. Actually, I'm not sure if maybe Chris might be having Oh, he might be having some technical difficulties. Yeah. Okay. I don't see him. All right. Um, all right. So we'll go through the chat. If anyone has uh, other questions too, feel free to drop those in the chat right now. Um, I think that John. Can... I can take a stab at the uh, the one that uh, came in uh, from Emily, um, who was asking. Um, about collection, collective action um, and any suggestions on how to push for systemic changes in um, uh, packaging and recycling systems. So the, I, the work that CCL does is absolutely amazing in, in putting a price on carbon. So this is, this is a, a, a direct way to um, affect that change. Um, what we do, um, we, we actually pay attention to what comes into our shop and how it's packaged. Um, that's part of our sort of rating process on when we bring products in. We've told a lot of people to go away because they want to send us stuff wrapped in plastic or they want to, you know, ship it in methods that are just not um, not aligned with what we try to do. So, so like, for example, we had a, um, uh, a manufacturer who, who did cheeses, um, who does vegan cheeses. And uh, he was wrapping them in a uh, plastic-based wrapper, which most cheeses, strangely enough, nowadays come in. Um, and we asked him if he could change it to, uh, to one of the plant-based cellophanes or, um, or a paper wrapper. And he said, huh, I never thought about that. I have another product that I use these for. So let me try it. Let me see if I can get it to run through production like that. And sure enough, he was able to do it. And he made that change um, specifically just because we asked. All you have to do is ask sometimes. You know, If you love a product and you hate the way it's packaged, contact the company you know, call them out on social media, do whatever you want to do to, to see if they can make a change. And sometimes they listen. And, and these are the, the important things. And I just want to add to that this year in July, Maine was the first state to sign an extended producer responsibility legislation into law for packaging and packaging materials. So they're actually putting the, the people making the products, they have to pay for costs that it, it, it costs to recycle the materials that they put into the market. Um, that's just the first one. There's other states that are starting to do it, but that's just kind of like uh, the tip of the iceberg there. We're putting the responsibility back on the producers. Instead of the consumers and instead of all of us who, who tend to, to be affected by, you know, most by it. Yeah. Hey, Justin, Anna, there's another question for you guys. Um, so Chris, uh, someone would like to know, what can you tell us about compostable plastics? Mm, yeah, compostable plastics. They're kind of interesting. So people are using um, plant-based uh, cellophanes and stuff like this. Um, and it's uh, they, they are actually compostable. Um, some of them are a little bit thicker um, and, and do require commercial composting. Um, but uh, many of the plant-based cellophanes you can actually just put in your garden um, and, you know, or what have you. Um, they, the, the thing that you don't want to do with them, though, is send them to a landfill 
um, because again, they're not going to do anyone any good in a landfill. Um, so, so if you if you do have a plant-based cellophane, which a, a lot of manufacturers are kind of making the switch over to this instead of a petroleum-based um, uh, uh, sort of plastic. Um, the plant-based cellophanes can be composted. And if you have a commercial composting service coming, or if you're, you know, even in Alexandria here, they do, the city does a uh, compost collection um, at the farmer's market on Saturdays. Um, these, these type of things are, this is, this is where you want to put your compostable plastics. So. There was also a question in the uh, chat about the recording. Um, we're actually going to, Put this recording on our Appalachia Regional YouTube channel, and we'll we'll send the recording out to everyone after. And Chris is here; he's on the phone. Yes. Also, I um, I saw a comment where um, someone said, "Yes, if we, you know, all these steps, like they're not only helping make our world more beautiful, but it's making our world healthy. Because the thing is, all of these actions, they're not." They're not only affecting our earth, but it affects us because we live on the earth. So it's really about, um, you know, making the world better and preserving it for not only us, but future generations uh, so that we can, you know, sustain our living. Uh, we have another question. Are there, oh, okay. So uh, someone would like me to go over the steps for the challenge again. Okay, step one, simple sustainable swap. Step two is use CCL's tools and contact your local representatives. It can be either the email or the phone call, uh, whichever one you prefer. And then the third step is just share what you did. Talk about it so people can keep this conversation going. And when you, if you do post it on social media to share, please use the hashtag simple sustainable steps challenge. I'll drop that in the chat again. And you can also tag Mason and Greens and CCL Virginia uh, to let them know what you did. And I'll put that in the chat right now. Okay, just sent it. And that concludes our time for today. And uh, if there are any last questions, we'll uh, answer those in the email, but I think, I, uh, I think we've got all of them. And I would just really like to thank all of our speakers and volunteers today. The webinar planning team of Justin, Anna, uh, Colin, John, and you know, uh, like everyone on the team who helped with this and you the participants for making this happen. We, we definitely have a long way to go in addressing climate change, but with all of us working on some of the sustainable steps that we've laid out for you today, I know we will make a difference because there is no simple solution to climate change, but there are a lot of simple steps that we can take. And these simple steps, um, you know, the swaps or just using a tool to make your voice heard, they don't take a lot of time. And so anyone who is busy can very easily do these and we will make a difference together. So please watch your email for the resource page. We will include, uh, uh, you know, all the all these different resources. Um, of course, Mason and Greens being a great place to go. Um, and we'll also, you know, send you the information for the recording if you want to share. Um, and thank you, everyone, so much. Happy Sustainability Day! Thank you, Michelle. Thanks, Michelle. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, thank you, everyone. Thank you.